Welcome to lecture 5.2, orthogonality. Last time, we defined an inner product space as a vector space with a symmetric positive definite bilinear form. This generalized the notion of the dot product in standard Euclidean space Rn. Fundamental properties of Euclidean space carried over to this more general setting of an inner product space. Things like the law of cosines, the Cauchy-Schwartz and triangle inequalities. These allow us to define analogs of concepts like length, namely the norm of x is just the square root of the inner product of x with itself. And the angle is defined by its cosine. So cosine of x is the inner product of x with y divided by norm x times norm y. Remember, by the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality, this is guaranteed to be between negative 1 and 1. Now, I will continue to say things like x dot x and x dot y just because dot is a very convenient one-syllable verb, even if I mean the more general inner product. And I should say that we define these things for the dot product, but I still use this, these symbols, and the proof completely carries over to inner product spaces. There is nothing special about the dot product in the proof of these results. If an inner product space is a generalization of Euclidean space, then the term orthogonal is the analog of perpendicular. Formally, two vectors x and y are orthogonal if their inner product is zero. And we will write this using the same perp symbol that we do for vectors being perpendicular in Euclidean space. So two vectors are perpendicular in Euclidean space if their dot product is zero, and they're orthogonal in a generalized Euclidean space if their inner product is zero. We all know the famous Pythagorean theorem in Euclidean geometry. So here it is in vector notation. If we, if we have two vectors, x and y, which are perpendicular, then that means they form a right angle, and so the hypotenuse is x plus y. So the Pythagorean theorem says that x squared, norm x squared plus norm y squared equals norm x plus y squared, and this carries over exactly to the general inner product spaces. And it's easy to see why. In the last lecture we computed that the norm of x plus y squared is the norm of x squared plus the norm of y squared plus 2x dot y, and if x and y are orthogonal, then that is just zero, and we are left with the same old Pythagorean theorem. Now, a word of warning. We saw in the previous lecture, I gave an example where the inner product of x and y was defined by, I think it was y1, y2, times 2, 1, 1, 2, times x1, x2. And with this definition, the standard unit basis vectors, or what we normally call the standard unit basis vectors, 1, 0, and 0, 1, they ended up having only a 60 degree angle between them. So be careful when we say orthogonal, because how we embed these vectors um, using our standard coordinate system is not necessarily indicative of the actual coordinate system or the angle between them. So generalizing our products can be a little bit deceiving in this way. I think we also proved that these vectors had length root 2 with respect to this inner product. And I'm mentioning this here because we are going to come back to this example and we're going to figure out what vectors are orthogonal. It seems intuitive that, you know, I can ask what's orthogonal to 1, 0, that it's going to be something out here. If this is 60 degrees, then 90 degrees is going to be something bigger than this, but the only question is, how much bigger? To start off, I want to convince you why orthogonal bases are nice. I mean, it's, it seems obvious, but let's, let's go through the motions. Suppose x1 up to xn is an orthogonal basis. Not necessarily orthonormal. Now, I haven't defined orthonormal, but you likely know what it is, and you might be thinking this, but all I'm saying is that these vectors are mutually perpendicular. 
given an arbitrary vector in x, because this is a basis, we can write v as an, a linear combination of the xi's. We can find a formula for ai by applying the following linear map to both sides. So let's take our inner product and let's plug in xi to the second coordinate or the first coordinate. Either one will work. Remember, if we do that to a bilinear function, we get a linear function. So if we do that up here, then the left-hand side becomes v dot xi. Remember, I still use the verb dot. And the right-hand side, we get a1 x1 xi. And I think you see what's going to happen. a i x i x i dot 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 up to a n x n x i. And the key is because these are orthogonal, all of these terms are going to go to zero except for the ith one. And of course, an a i is going to pull out. And what we get is that v dot x i equals a i times x i dot x i. And this gives us a formula for a i. Namely, a i is the inner product of v and x i with the inner product of x i and itself. What we are basically doing here is projecting the vector v onto the ith coordinate x i. So a i is the magnitude of v in the x i direction. A magnitude is length, and for that we need an inner product. So a way to think about this pictorially is if this is v and this is x1, then this length here is, how do I want to draw this? This length here is a i. And we also may want to speak of the vector in the x i direction of magnitude a i. And in other words, a i x i. And so, so v is a 1 x 1 plus a i x i plus a n x n. So this is the component of that vector v in the x i direction. So I will give a definition and notation for this, sort of a remark, sort of a definition. The projection of a vector x onto another vector u. So there's two things we want to keep track of, both the magnitude, and I will denote that with a lowercase projection, x dot u over u dot u, and then also the vector, so that component a i x i, well I guess in this case it's, it's a x and a u, so that I'm going to write that with a capital P, projection of x onto u. And that brings us to a new definition. We have vectors x1 up to xk, which are orthonormal, if, if you take the inner product of any two of them, you get zero if they're different and one if they're the same. So this part means that they are mutually orthogonal, and then the other part means that each one has unit length. So remember that the norm of xi squared is xi dot xi. We want each of these to have length one. So sometimes we denote this with delta ij, so this is the Kronecker delta. So this is 1 if i and j are the same, and 0 otherwise. So a way to think about this, how I visualize this, is I think of this as like our standard unit basis vectors where everything is, is a right angle. I've already given you the warning that um, of you know sometimes the vectors in different inner product spaces may look how we render them. They I draw them to be 90 degrees apart, but the actual angle is like 60. So I've given you that warning. I don't need to go over that again. This is the mental picture I have um, for orthonormal vectors. And we're not assuming here that we have n vectors. So this doesn't have necessarily have to be a basis. But 
One comment about this is when we have an orthonormal basis, these projections be, these projections become a lot simpler. So in that case, um, we can just ignore the bottom of that because that's equal to one. So let me give you a simple example. I might have done this in an earlier lecture. I really don't remember. I know I've done it in at least one or more of my other classes. So let's let's take a a vector, I'm going to say 4, 3, so that's that's this vector right here, v, and um, this is 4, 3, which of course is 4, e1 plus 3, e2, and e1 is down here, this is 1, 0, we're going to use the standard dot product, e2 is 0, 1, now, I can ask, suppose this is like your velocity vector, I can say, how fast are you traveling in the x direction? And the answer is, is 4. It's, you just drop a perpendicular, and it's this length right here. So that is 4, and that is v dot e1. And how fast are you traveling in the, in the uh, y direction? That's going to be 3. That's v dot e1. E two. Now another question I can ask is how fast are you traveling in the in the in the north east direction? So that's in this direction, and the answer to that is you take the standard unit basis vector here, and I'm going to call that v one, which is root two over two, root two over two, and you project v onto v one, and and so I, I should say this is. Um, v dot e1 is, is this dot uh, for 3. The order doesn't matter. It's symmetric. And, and this, this is approximately this 4.95. And so that, that makes sense that this vector is length 4.95 in, in that direction. Now, what, what's often the case is you don't necessarily have an orthonormal basis. And I'm going to do some examples later in this lecture, especially involving functions and polynomials, where we don't necessarily want to um, normalize the vector at every step because we go, we'll get nasty radicals. So if instead we just had the vector one one here, so uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna say uh, I don't know what letter to use. U, say u is equal to in this case one one, and I wanted to project v into the u direction. That then I use this this full formula, or either one of these full formulas depending on whether we want magnitude or the vector. And, and I will say, so v um, dot u, I'm going to switch to this inner product notation, u dot u. Um, actually, let me, let me do it this way. Um, we can normalize u first. So, so we can project v onto the, so the normalized version of u is u divided by the norm of u. So, so that is the projection onto the unit basis vector in the u direction. And then this vector, that unit vector again, is u over norm u. So in this case, we can write this as v dot u divided by norm u squared. And this is v dot u over u dot u. So this is another way to derive, oh, and I, and then there, there's a u here that that doesn't go away. So I, I also forgot my my u right here. But this is another way to rederive this projection formula in addition to what we did up here, which was just taking the applying this linear map to both sides. So I hope this helps. This is what we're doing. Sometimes we have unit vectors to project onto. Other times we we don't. So we use this more complicated formula. To summarize so far, orthogonal is the abstract version of perpendicular, and orthonormal is the analog of being perpendicular and unit length. Orthonormal bases are really desirable. If x1 up to xn is an orthonormal basis, and we have two vectors in our space, say x and y, let's write x as a sum of ai xi and y as the sum of bi xi, then as we just saw, 
AI is the projection of X onto XI, or the inner product of X with XI. We can keep going with this idea, and I claim that the inner product of X and Y is just the product of AI times BI from 1 up to N. Now you may look at this and say, wait, this is just the standard dot product, and our inner product is not necessarily the standard dot product, and both of those are true. So our standard inner product might be, let's do that example that we did before, um, b1, b2 times 2, 1, 1, 2 times a1, a2. So we are def here, and we'll, we'll do this example um, fairly soon as well. The inner product of x and y is, I'm going to write this as y transpose ax. Even something like this, that's definitely not the dot product, if we take an orthonormal basis with respect to this inner product. Now remember, that's not going to look like a standard orthonormal basis with respect to the dot product. It's going to be, as we will see shortly, it's going to look something like a vector here and a vector out there. But if we take one of these orthonormal bases, then with respect to that basis, the inner product of x and y behaves or computes just like the dot product. Now let's let's see why that is. So the inner product of x and y is the inner product of a i x i. It's just bilinearity and orthogonality. B i x i. So we could break this up into a, a giant sum. So this is i equals 1 up to n, i equals 1 up to n. So we break this up into a, a giant sum of a i x i b, j, x, j over all i and j. So you can think of this as a double sum if you want. And of course, all of these terms are going to be zero except for the ones where i and j match. So we get i equals 1 up to n of a, i, x, i, b, i, x, i. And that's just the sum from i equals 1 up to n of a i b i x i x i. This, of course, is just 1. So we get this sum as desired. So at first glance, a little bit counterintuitive. But the big theme here is if we pick an orthonormal basis, any inner product basically behaves just like the dot product. And of course, a special case of that, if we take y to be equal to x, is that the norm of x squared is just the sum from i equals 1 up to n of a i squared. So this should look just like the Pythagorean theorem, but in a general inner product space. So that is why orthonormal bases are really desirable. One last comment that I want to make here, because it will come up a number of times in the future, is that if we have a matrix A and the columns are orthonormal, so they're, then they're automatically an orthonormal basis, so say x1, x2, up to xn, then, and we take A transpose A. Think about what that looks like. So A transpose, the, the rows are going to be an orthonormal basis. Then this is going to, then the, the entries are going to be, um, so the, this first entry is going to be x1 dot x1. So here I'm going to use just the, the standard dot, well, I'll use inner product notation, why not? x1 dot x1, and then the next one's going to be x1 dot x2, etc. x2 dot x2. So this matrix is the identity I should say, what does it mean for this matrix to be the identity? Well, that happens if and only if all of these diagonal entries are zero. In other words, if xi dot xi equals one, and if all off diagonal entries xi dot xj equals zero. So that is equivalent to the columns of the matrix being orthonormal. So that'll come up later. Unfortunately, 
such a matrix is not said to be orthonormal, but it's said to be orthogonal. So an orthogonal matrix has orthonormal columns. I think that's a terrible definition, but it is what it is. We have to live with it. Let's now do some examples of orthogonality. So let's compare what it means in several inner product spaces. Now we know what it means in the standard in Rn with the standard dot product. Let me just draw R2 here. E1 and E2 are of course orthogonal because their dot product is zero. And we saw in the previous lecture that these are not, or that that the angle between these two was 60 degrees. And um, with respect to this curious inner product. So let, let's go back and review that and take it a little bit further. So here, the inner product of x and y, let me write x as a1, a2, and y as b1, b2. This is defined as y transpose a x. Now, let me draw the same picture again. So if, if E1 is this vector, and then E2 is up here, I'm drawing it in black because it's not really the vector I want to highlight, then you know we, we can ask what this angle is. And in the previous lecture, we determined that the cosine of that angle, which we know is E1 dot E2, divided by the norm of E1 times the norm of E2. And we computed that E1 dot E2 was just 1, and each of these was root 2, perhaps surprisingly, with respect to this strange inner product. So this is equal to 1 half. So we, in standard Euclidean space, um, the angle of 60 degrees has cosine 1 half. So even though these things look to be perpendicular, with respect to this strange inner product, they really are meet at an angle of 60 degrees. So that begs the question, what vector is perpendicular or orthogonal to E1. It would make sense that it's going to be something that is sort of out here, but what is that vector? So let's, let's solve for that. Let's put E1 in for x and solve for y. So uh, E1 dot y is b1, b2, 2, 1, 1, 2, times 1, 0, and this is b1, b2, times 2, 1, and this is 2, b1, plus b2 equals 0. So in other words, b2 equals negative 2, b1. So that means that this entry is negative 2 times whatever that entry is. So for example, the vector um, negative 1, 2, um, I don't know what do I want to call this, let's call this V2, this is orthogonal with E1. So this may be a little bit counterintuitive because it looks like the angle is more than 90, but it's because it's with respect to a different geometry. Now something also a little bit strange is I said b2 is, so anything that's, any vector that satisfies this is orthogonal to e1. And well, you know what else satisfies that? Down here, if you take the vector 1, negative 2, these things are, this is also orthogonal to that by, this, by the same reason, because it satisfies this equation. So yeah, perhaps strangely, this angle here is, you can think of it as like 90 degrees. Well, um, and when I say you think of it as 90 degrees, I mean the cosine of this is, is zero because the cosine of that angle is E1 dot this thing, which divided by the norms, which is zero. And this is analog of a right angle up here as well. I will leave it as an exercise to figure out what is orthogonal to E2. It shouldn't be much different than this in terms of the process. It just comes down to plugging in the numbers and figuring it out. Next, for fun, I'll give you a quick 
high-level tour of how orthogonality arises in differential equations and related topics, in particular Fourier series and strum louisville theory. So I'm not going to give a lot of details, especially because these all involve infinite dimensional vector spaces, and when you have something like that, you have a big issue about convergence and infinite sums, and you know what does it mean to converge in norm or converge point-wise, things like that. So won't get into that, but I just want to give you the flavor of why orthogonality is important beyond just things like Rn with the standard dot product or with some weird little inner product like this. Our first example involves Fourier series. For this, let x be the space of two pi periodic piecewise real valued functions. And define the inner product between f and g as the integral of f of x times g of x from negative pi to pi divided by x. So the integral is like the analog, the continuous version of the sum. So for the dot product, we, you know, we multiply the coordinates together and add them up. And here we're multiplying the individual points or, or at, at every x, f times g, and adding them up over one complete cycle. Now, before I go further, let me say a couple comments. First of all, 2 pi periodic. I don't necessarily mean the period is exactly 2 pi. Just mean that f of x plus 2 pi equals f of x for all x. So maybe the period is pi, or maybe it's pi over 5. I just mean that after 2 pi, the, the function has cycled some integer number of times. Now, piecewise, um, I don't need to restrict these functions to be continuous, but I need the, I just need them to be integrable. But not any integrable function is going to work. So, for example, here's a non, here's one that won't work. So, if if you have the function, let me use red. It comes out a little bit better. Um, that is zero. So, on negative pi to pi, it's zero everywhere except maybe it's one at the origin. So, if we were to repeat the, this function, in other words, make this periodic. And then compute the inner product of this, or I guess the, the norm of this function. Let's just do the norm squared because that's easier. So that's the inner product of f with itself. That's 1 over pi, negative pi to pi, f of x squared dx. We're going to get 0 because if we integrate this function, it's 0 almost everywhere, everywhere except this one point. So the integral of that function is 0. But if we include a function like this, then this inner product is not going to be positive definite. So that's why I say piecewise, and we don't need them to be continuous. And, and actually what we'll do is we'll talk about how, so the idea of a Fourier series is that we can write periodic functions with sines and cosines. And that includes discontinuous functions like, like square waves. So we definitely want to include these in our space. I claim that the set of all cosine of nx and sine of mx is orthonormal with respect to this inner product. I'll get to this weird constant in a moment. But first, let, let me just verify that the sines and the cosines are orthonormal. What that means is that the integral, well, I, I write it as an inner product first. That means that if I take any cosine of nx and I take the inner product with the sine of mx, I'm going, get, I'm going to get it 0. So by definition, that is 1 over pi, negative pi to pi, uh, cosine of nx, sine of mx, dx. And I claim that that's going to be 0. Similarly, if I take the cosine of nx and the cosine of mx, that inner product, that's going to, by definition, 1 over pi, negative pi to pi, cosine of nx, cosine of mx dx, that this is going to be uh, the Kronecker delta nm. In other words, this is going to be 1 if n equals m and 0 if n is not equal to m. And this is something you can easily check with, 
with trick identities, or I think probably the easiest way is to write cosine um, as, let me write it like, cosine of x is e to the i and x plus e to the negative i and x over 2, and sine of x equals e to the i and x minus e to the negative i and x divided by 2i. So that it's easy to check these identities hold, and there's actually one more that we need. We need that the sine of nx sine of mx, or that integral, is which it is 1 over pi times negative pi to pi sine of nx sine of mx dx, that this is also equal to delta nm as well. So if we can prove, or we, if we verify all of these things, then this set of sines and cosines is indeed orthonormal. Now, this, this last function, um, it's un slightly unfortunate, I guess, that if you compute the, the norm of the function 1, or let's compute the norm squared, that's 1.1, 1 .1, which is 1 over pi times negative pi to pi times the function 1 times d x and this is easily seen to be to be 2. So unfortunately the the norm of of 1 is is root 2. So if you want to normalize the constant function you you write it as 1 divided by root 2 and now this thing has unit length and it's also easy to check that that if you take the inner product of cosine of nx and 1, that you're going to get 0. And similarly, sine of nx with 1 is going to give you 0 as well for any scalar of 1. So the, these are orthogonal. And if you normalize this, they become orthonormal. And, and this is easy to see because you know, what is this inner product? It's just the integral of, of cosine of nx over from negative pi to pi. and if you think about a side area, you're going to get zero. Now, I guess one thing I didn't justify is why is this actually a basis? So it's a non-trivial fact that every function in this space can actually be written using sines and cosines and a constant. Now, any audio engineer or musician is going to be, tell you that, say, well, yeah, it's just a sound wave and, it's, and it breaks up into its fundamental components. So I'm not going to prove that, but I, I will claim that this is indeed not just an orthonormal set, but an orthonormal basis. What this means is that we can write each 2 pi periodic function uniquely as a linear combination of these sine and cosine waves and a constant. Now, the fact that I'm writing this as an infinite sum is one of those details that I'm, again, I'm sweeping under the rug. It's beyond the scope of this class. Um, but it is necessary if we want to write functions like a square wave, which is discontinuous, using sine and cosine waves. Um, so, but however, even if we do this, um, we don't have complete control. So it, it, if we write this using sines and cosines, then the function that we get is g at the point of discontinuity will evaluate to the average value. So that, that again is a detail that I'm not too worried about. But what I want to focus on is that we have formulas for these ANs and BNs. These are just projections of F onto the cosine of N X direction. In other words, it's the inner product of F and cosine of N X. And here is an explicit formula for that coefficient AN. Similarly, bn is the projection, it's the, it's the magnitude of f in the sine of nx direction, and that's a projection, just the inner product of f with sine of nx, and that is, here, here's a formula for that, the integral of f sine of x nx from over one complete cycle divided by pi. Finally, here is that remark spelled out once more. There are technical details that need to be addressed regarding the use of infinite sums and convergence, but these are beyond the scope of this class, and I won't go into details. Finally, I want to say a couple more things. First of all, um, a naught over two. Um, you know, why are we using a two instead of a root two or just a naught? 
Um, there's a number of ways you could justify this that I won't get into, but one nice explanation is that this allows the formula for a n to also hold for n equals zero. So to compute a naught, just plug in zero, the cosine of zero is one, and compute this integral. I also want to tie this back to differential equations. So it is, you know, I said before that my examples would involve differential equations, and this doesn't seem like it, it does, but uh, here's the connection. So if you have a, say, a vibrating string, and, and you pluck it in the middle, so these endpoints are held fixed, then you can get uh, waves that look like this. You can get waves, basically sine or cosine waves. All right, I guess in this case, it's sine waves. Um, and these are, um, are solution, these are solutions to a partial differential equation that ut equals c squared uxx, where u is a function of x and t. And when you solve this, you basically break up the time and the spatial components separately, and the spatial components you end up getting y double prime equals negative lambda y. And the um, and where y is 2 pi periodic, um, if, if this is length two pi. Um, otherwise, it, um, it could be something else. So y of, of x plus 2 pi equals y of x. So solutions to this equation are sines and cosines, and they are precisely at any sine and cosine of this form. So any solution to this is going to be a Fourier series like this. And even if our initial um, position of the of of the string is is something that's maybe like I don't know a a triangle wave like this, we can extend this to be periodic and and um, physically, you can definitely pluck a string. You can start a string in this position and just let go, and there still will be a wave. Um, so even a, a function like this, you can write using sine and cosine waves. And, and that's a remarkable fact, is you know, these are smooth and, and this is not. So this, this whole setup of Fourier series, the fact that you can write any periodic function using sines and cosines. Again, something that an audio engineer, a musician, it's obvious, it's, it's a sound wave, but linear algebra and the, the theory behind it of vector spaces and inner product spaces not only guarantees that, but it, it tells us, it gives us a formula for how to compute these coefficients, how to find these a n's and b n's. And the theory really is no different than how we find the coefficients of this v, which is for e1, plus three E two that we did earlier. Now, what is four? Four is the inner product of V onto E one. So that's exactly what this is saying here. So it's a really powerful theory that has some really neat results for actual applied problems in science and engineering. And this is really just the beginning. It gets better. Fourier series are a special case of solutions to what are called strom leuvel problems, which are differential equations um, of the form Ly equals lambda y, where L is a second order differential equation. Here is one such example. I won't get into the details of this. So this is for functions defined on negative one to one. The eigenvalues of this differential operator end up being, well, there's infinitely many of them, and they're of the form n times n plus one for positive n. And the eigenvectors, or we call them eigenfunctions, turn out to solve Legendre's equation, which is a differential equation like this. And this comes up when you want to solve the heat or the wave equation in spherical coordinates. For each n, this equation has a two-dimensional solution space. And one of those is going to be a polynomial. The other one's going to be an infinite power series. And if you take a class in differential equations and you study the power series method, you can learn how to solve them. Now, this polynomial doesn't have a nice closed form solution, but it, it can be defined implicitly like this. Now, it's not clear what it looks like, you know, what this thing is, but th this is one way to characterize it. And it's a fundamental result of strom leuvel theory that any such equation 
is going to have eigenfunctions that are orthogonal with respect to a certain inner product. In this case, it's just f of x times g of x over the interval. So it's a lot like what we saw for Fourier series, but we, we don't really need to normalize it. There's no reason to. It can be checked that if you take these Legendre polynomials and you compute their inner product, which here's the definition, that they are zero for n and m being different. That's guaranteed by orthogonality. But also if m and n are the same, then we get, we don't get one. They're not orthonormal, but we get two over two n plus one. Now we could normalize them to make them orthonormal, but that's going to mess up this formula and, and other things. So it's, it's just easier in this case to not normalize and deal with an orthogonal basis instead of an orthonormal basis. By orthogonality and the fact that these aren't just orthogonal, but an orthogonal basis, every function f that's continuous on this domain can be expressed using Legendre polynomials. So think of this like a Fourier, it's like a generalized Fourier series. Instead of using sines and cosines, we use these polynomials like this and linear algebra and inner product spaces. The theory gives us a formula for the coefficients cn. It's just the projection of f onto the nth basis vector. So f dot pn over pn dot pn. And if you simplify that, that's just n plus 1 half times the inner product of f with pn. And so that's, and this we have a formula for right here. So once again, the, the power of linear algebra um, allows us to write arbitrary functions on negative 1 to 1 using Legendre polynomials. And here is an example of the first eight Legendre polynomials, both what they are algebraically and what they look like graphically. Finally, our last example is also a strum luvo problem. And it's, it's, you can think of it like a generalized eigenvalue problem because you have this, it's not ly equals lambda y anymore, but you got this weight here. So if you want to learn more about this, you know, take a course on Fourier analysis, a graduate level course or functional analysis to motivate why this thing comes here. But in this particular case, that, that W is this one over root one minus X squared. So this is uh, Chebyshev's equation. It comes up a lot in numerical analysis techniques. And the eigenvalues for this are n squared for any integer, positive integer n, and the corresponding eigenfunctions solve Chebyshev's differential equation, which is, well, it's basically what you get from this by just plugging this into lambda and simplifying, but it looks, it looks like this. Once again, you can solve this using the power series method. You get two linearly independent solutions, and one of those is going to be a polynomial. This is called a Chebyshev polynomial. And for this one, it's easiest to define it recursively. So the zeroth degree one is one. The first degree one is x. And then you have this recurrence relation. The n plus first one is 2x tn minus tn minus 1 of x. By strum luvel theory, these polynomials are orthogonal with respect to the inner product, so it's going to be like the last one, but we have to multiply by this by this weighted function w of x here. So the integral of f of x, g of x, divided by root 1 minus x squared dx. And it can be checked that if you take two Chebyshev polynomials and you compute this integral, well, if n and m are different, then you're going to get 0. So that's why this delta is here. But if, if they're the same, well, if, if they're both zero, you, you actually get pi. But if they're the same um, and non-zero, then you get one half pi. So they're not quite orthogonal. They could be normalized, but if you normalize them, that's going to mess up this recurrence relation. So it's just easier to deal with an orthogonal basis rather than an orthonormal basis. But by orthogonality, Every function f that's continuous on negative 1 to 1 can be expressed using Chebyshev polynomials. And we can probably weaken this continuous a little bit, but it's easier just to make it continuous. 
Um, so it can be expressed as a linear combination of Chebyshev polynomials. And once again, this Cn is just the projection of f onto the nth basis vector, nth basis vector Tn. And um, if you use this formula, um, that's just 2 over pi times the pro inner product of f with Tn, which is, of course, this is given by an integral, or that part's given by this integral right here. Now, one little detail you may have noticed that I, I instead of using equals, I used this little similarity. Um, so technically, this is one of those details that I'm not going to get into. Um, there's a strange norm because of this weighted function. So there's a different, when I say converge, when I say f, saying f equals this, I really mean f converges to this. You know, you might look at it, the picture and say, well, that doesn't look like it's converging, converging very fast. And that's because it's the difference of converging point-wise versus converging in norm, especially when we have a, a, a norm that involves a weighted function. So this is some functional analysis and Fourier analysis details that I am not including because I just want to give you the big picture. Finally, here are the first eight Chebyshev polynomials. We say of the first kind because there are related ones of the second kind. And here are the graphs of these polynomials. Notice that we do not normalize these because if we did, we would get radicals and square roots pretty quickly and then we would get nested radicals and these coefficients would just be incredibly messy. And it's just easier to work with an orthogonal basis in this case, even though an orthogonal basis has a lot of even nicer properties. So the, the big idea in this lecture is how nice it is to have an orthogonal basis. And it's remarkable as to how applicable the theory of linear algebra and inner product spaces and orthogonality is to a number of applied topics like from differential equations um, and from science and engineering. And basically the, all we're doing here is we're just projecting a vector v like we've did before, say, let's call it 4e1 plus 3e2 onto, its, onto an orthogonal basis. In this case, it's orthonormal basis, and 4 is just the inner product of v dot e1. That's all we're doing in these applications. So hopefully this motivates the idea that projection is also a very fundamental topic. And not just projection onto vectors, but later we will project onto subspaces. In fact, a lot of statistics, especially linear regression, think like least squares, is behind the scenes just projecting onto some subspace. So that's what we'll do in the next lecture. We will talk about orthogonal projections, and we'll also talk about how to construct an orthonormal basis, not just from an orthogonal basis and normalized, but from any basis. So that's something called the Gram-Schmidt process. So don't go anywhere.